welcome to the forum, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the panel, it is my great pleasure today to welcome to our program James J. McCauley. Professor McCauley, who serves at this time uh, in the, the field of education at Eastern Washington State College, is with us to discuss many issues today. As to background, uh, Professor McCauley was born in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he received his education at two places. First of all, he received his BA degree from the University College in Dublin in 1962. And later in 1968, he received an MA degree from the University of Arkansas. As to career background, Mr. McCauley has been involved as art correspondent, a book reviewer, an associate editor, an arts consultant, a lecturer, and of course, a professor in the academic world. Among other things that the professor has been involved in uh, has been publications, including collections of verse, uh, observations, and a new address. There are many, many other publications that I could deal with, but I do not want to take time from the questioning. But in addition to those publications, he also uh, had the honor of being selected as one of the 20 outstanding poets in the United States by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, following this selection, he, like others, was interviewed by the United States News and World Report. Also, Professor McCauley serves on the editorial board as the Northwest representative of the Virginia Commonwealth University series in contemporary poetry. Professor McCauley, it's a pleasure having you on our program. Thank you. I also today want to welcome back one of our regular panel members to my far left is Mrs. Mary Lou Reed. Mrs. Reed is uh, most active in one of the two major political parties in the state of Idaho. In addition to this, she is also very well known as a spokesman and worker in environmental uh, problems and issues. And as to educational background, Mrs. Reed did her graduate work in theology at Columbia University in New York City. Welcome back, Mary Lou. Thank you, Tony. Also, it's my pleasure to have back on our program, uh, once again, as a visiting panel member, uh, Mr. James McLeod, who is a professor of English at North Idaho College. Uh, Mr. McLeod was educated at the University of Washington, where he received his baccalaureate degree, and at Eastern Washington State College, where he received his master's. Welcome once again to our program. We'll proceed to questions at once, and the first question today from Mrs. Reed. Jim, let's first ask some questions about you, find out about a little bit more about your background. Could you tell us just how you got from Ireland to the United States? What brought you away from there to us? Uh, a boat. A <laughs> boat. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, probably what uh, got me going first was dollars, frankly. Uh, I, I suffered from the same disease that uh, the Irish have suffered from since the famine of 1845, the delusion that the streets of America are paved with gold and all you need is a pickaxe. Uh, I, I uh, came to the States, in fact, uh, because I felt that uh, my particular field, poetry, got more attention here, per capita, so to speak, than it uh, did in Ireland at that time. There's been quite a change in Irish attitudes there uh, since I left. I, think, I, I don't think my departure had anything to do with this change, but uh, now, for instance, they have income tax relief for writers and things like this. Um, I found myself, uh, uh, really, the, the second thing was that I, I felt I needed to learn my trade, so to speak. I, I had written several books, and I'd been uh, writing since I was 19. But I really didn't know what, what I was doing, you know. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Ireland didn't have any creative writing uh, programs in colleges or anything of that nature at all. So I, I got an offer from the University of Arkansas to go there to work in their writing program and did, and ben benefited a great deal from that. And uh, I think the, the third uh, factor in that was that I felt uh, Ireland to be a rather uncomfortable place for me as a writer, at any rate, in that uh, there is official censorship of publications. There's a 
generally rather hard to pin down uh, a repressive uh, atmosphere in Ireland for writers. Uh, that may have something to do with why there are so many writers from Ireland and why so many of us have, uh, have become exiles, in voluntary exile from Ireland. Uh, when, you, when you say writer, do you, have you always been a poet or do you also do prose? Well, I, I find it easier to, uh, to write poetry. I think it's something to do with the typewriter. You don't have to you know, go all the way to the end of the line on a typewriter if you're writing poetry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to type. Uh, that's been uh, a little bit silly about it, but it, I think uh, that has something to do with, with my attitude towards poetry, or, or did have at one stage. Um, I find it extremely difficult to write good prose uh, myself. Uh, I've been trying to write a novel for about four years now, and I find it very difficult to think like a prose writer to put this all together. But you do uh, find that you think as a poet, you think in, yeah. in these terms. Yeah. Uh, if I can make a crude analogy, uh, uh, the, the fiction writer, the novelist, uh, thinks like an architect, whereas the, the poet is inclined to think more like a painter. Uh, th that's a very crude analogy, but, uh, uh, you know, when I turn to writing fiction, I find myself decorating walls, but not thinking of what, where the walls are going to be when the total structure is up. And uh, that makes it difficult for me to write well in prose. Uh, short prose, yes. I, I've written some short prose and of course I made a living for 12 years uh, writing criticism and reviewing and feature writing and that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, hacking around. You know. Mr. McLeod. Uh, I noted, uh, Jim, in, in the introduction that you are, are the Northwest, Northwest representative on the editorial board of the Virginia Commonwealth University series in contemporary poetry. Could you uh, describe what your role is with that organization and what that organization uh, in, hopes to do? Yeah, uh, well th this is uh, one of a, a number of things that that, uh, that sort of came to me in my capacity as joint director, the director mainly in charge of verse uh, at Eastern, uh, Eastern Washington State College. Uh, we are the Northwest Center for uh, crowd called Associated Writing Programs which is a national organization funded at least in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, uh, it's a kind of loose federation of writers and writing programs who are interested in the idea that writing can be taught at college level at least. And uh, they co-sponsored this venture with VCU Press, Virginia Commonwealth University Press, they asked 22 of us around the country, in various regions around the country, to act as sort of preliminary editors for selecting a manuscript which VCU Press will publish. Uh, the whole venture, I, I understand, is being financed by uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the final choice of manuscripts will be made by Richard Eberhardt, the eminent poet. And uh, we are interested in getting manuscripts, uh, book-length manuscripts of poetry from poets in this region. Uh, and uh, uh, I've already had uh, just really just a handful, but the standard is extraordinarily high. Uh, there are several manuscripts which I've, I've had the pleasure to read uh, so far. The closing date for this thing, incidentally, is the end of December. Uh, I've, I've had several manuscripts which I would consider publishable, and uh, I'm going to have a hard time picking one. I get to pick one to send along, uh, but uh, it really, it, it's really something that I'm proud to be in, involved in. <laughs> Professor uh, Macaulay, I would like to uh, get into a quite uh, political issue that certainly come to the attention of the entire world in, in recent years and has uh, been a, a, a very difficult political problem that has not been resolved, and yet political leaders of various countries in the world have been so concerned, and that is in Northern Ireland, the 
the, really the war that's gone on and the violence and the death and uh, the clash between the Protestants and Catholics. I wish as uh, certainly a person who is highly educated and uh, from that part of the world, if you would take time for a few minutes to explain to us in your viewpoint uh, what really are the bases uh, uh, for that conflict that is so long and, and so torn the people. Uh, may I also preface my question by saying that some people that one talks to claim that it is a religious war over religious issues, and others say that there are other deep-rooted questions and it is not a religious one. Would you give us your opinion? Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity, uh, perhaps, hopefully, to uh, 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 change some some ideas and, and straighten out some some of the record on this uh, but I, I also ought to say that I haven't been back since 1969 which was just when the the current warfare broke out I call it warfare uh, the news media call it terrorism but I have uh, reasons to call it warfare uh, the origins really of the current strife uh, go back. It is very difficult for uh, 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 an American to understand this. Uh, Jim will remember a conversation he was part of with the uh, Montana Seattle poet Richard Hugo when I went on at some length on this subject and he finally cut us off by saying uh, you know that's like getting fed up with Xerxes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the the trouble goes back to about 1603 when Queen Elizabeth finally uh, dissolved the Celtic uh, alliance of uh, the Earl of, of Tyrone and the Earl of Tyrconnell uh, and then planted some of the dissenter uh, Protestants on the land which had originally been owned and ruled by these clans. Uh, it, it, it may seem very strange to Americans that a, a matter of that nature that took place in 1603 could be so vital. Uh, it's really alive in the memories of the people today uh, in, in, the, in the north of Ireland. Uh, there were successive plantations of people because uh, w those first people who got so fed up were getting kicked around by both the Elizabethan armies and by the, the Celtic uh, people whom they'd supplanted, they finally emigrated to America and they're, they're the original black Irish as they're called. Um, the, uh, the, the way it has come down now is that uh, the matter of partitioning Ireland into Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland wasn't brought up till 1912. Uh, and th then it was uh, instigated by a group of, a very small group of about a half a dozen families headed by the Craig family, uh, who had uh, vested interests in shipbuilding and linen and distilling and, and the, the major industries of the northeast corner of Ireland, who saw for themselves a uh, disastrous situation if Ireland were finally uh, separated from England and became independent. Uh, and then they very deliberately set about uh, instigating uh, the, or yeah, through the Orange Orders, uh, instigating sectarian strife between Protestants and Catholics. And the end result is what we're getting now is what appears to be religious warfare, Protestants against Catholics, but in fact it is uh, the haves against the have-nots. It's in fact a civil rights struggle. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I, I get, I'm getting a little nervous now because I seem to be defending terrorism, and I, I'm not at all. Uh, uh, the recent bombings in, in Birmingham and, and London are outrageous. Uh, absolutely unforgivable and, and un indefensible, but uh, the, uh, the, the, there has always been these extremist fringes in Ireland. Uh, uh, if what peeves me a little bit is that uh, here in the United States we get simply one version of this, 
the Protestants versus the Catholics, and little uh, effort is made to see that there are two sides to this thing, that the partition of Ireland is an, uh, an absolutely unnatural act, that the fears of some kind of genocide taking place if North and South were unified are absolutely empty and false. Uh, the, uh, in my experience living in Ireland, there were, was never any kind of uh, prejudice uh, on religious basis, whatever. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, economic uh, control would be taken of industries, taken away from the uh, old families who owned them, uh, just didn't take place in Southern Ireland when it became independent. The Guinnesses and the Dockrells and so on, the people who owned the major commercial and industrial enterprises in Southern Ireland, still own them. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know how much that clarifies. It becomes very detailed in the clarification. The thing is, it is really a civil rights struggle. Uh, it is similar in certain aspects to the struggle in the Middle East between the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, in that the Palestinians want their land back, just as the so-called Catholic sector want their land back that was taken from them in 1603. And in the same way, you know, the, the Cypriot, uh, Greek Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot struggle has similar aspects. Um, uh, they, they have always, these things, uh, of course, yeah, even the Middle East and uh, the recent Bangladesh thing, they're, they're always leftovers, they, they always seem to me as an Irishman to be leftovers from the, uh, the, the rash, the, uh, the imperial uh, British Empire, you know, uh, uh, untidy corners of the British Empire which have not yet been tidied up. Dan, uh, I think you've done a very uh, fine job of clarifying uh, many points concerning this issue. Uh, but as the, what I would consider an expert on the, on the subject, what, in your opinion, will be the final resolution of this conflict? Or secondly, what do you recommend as a possible solution? But uh, again, I, I must probably so that the IRA won't come get me, I must disclaim any uh, claim to be a, an expert on this. As I say, I, I don't know the exact uh, situation since I left in 66 and uh, perhaps even if I were brand new from there uh, I, I wouldn't know any more than than uh, the normal man in the street in Ireland um, I, I think the the natural solution to this is a federation of north and south uh, uh, rather like a United States uh, setup or, or uh, the kind of federation that you've got in Western Germany between the various states of Germany. Uh, something like that, it seems to be the, the compromise solution. Uh, what the bloodbath people would like is exactly that, a bloodbath, and many experts, real experts in this, think there will be a terrible bloodbath in Ireland, in all of Ireland, and even overflowing into England. Uh, if further frustrations are, are put in the way of some kind of final resolution to this. Do you believe that if the British were to leave Northern Ireland and completely withdraw that this bloodbath would take place at this time? Not at all. I think that's, that's the first step, is get the British out of Northern Ireland. Uh, one, one thing that, that uh, never appears in the, the media over here, I, I get an Irish newspaper, it takes six weeks to get here. Uh, and the issue for six weeks ago mentioned two things that I have never seen in, in the American media at all. Uh, firstly, the appalling conditions in which uh, the so-called uh, suspected IRA members are incarcerated by the British Army. Uh, they are tortured, uh, they are uh, very badly housed, uh, they, they are in uh, appalling conditions and uh, protests have been made and, uh, to every possible uh, international body to have this remedied and the, the British Army and the British authorities have just uh, ignored these appeals. Uh, one incident occurred, the British Army 
This was, I guess, the end of October. The British Army had shot and killed a 17-year-old youth in the street and, uh, in the town of Newry, uh, just quite indiscriminately. Um, uh, this kind of thing we never hear about, the, the uh, effects of the British occupation, and that's what it is, uh, of Northern Ireland on the, on the civilian population. Uh, and just like Vietnam, uh, many people have called Northern Ireland Britain's Vietnam. Uh, the, their, own, their only solution is, is get out, because as long as they're there, they, are, they, be, they uh, prevent the final solution from being reached, which is some kind of federation of the two states. Uh, I think most Irish are ready to recognize that there are two states. Uh, recognize it, uh, what the Israelis call a, a political reality and political fact, that there are two states, but that it is very natural they should have uh, some kind of federation because their, their interests are common. And they are not all that common with British interests. Uh, this becomes very confusing for somebody who doesn't know the history of Ireland too well. Uh, uh, my own feeling is, uh, you know, as an Irishman, I belong to the community of Europe, uh, not to the community of the British Islands. Those guys in the other island have been my enemy too long. Thank you. Mrs. Reed. Can we tie this into your field, Jim? You have said earlier, at an earlier time on this campus, uh, you've suggested that poetry is an antithesis to, to violence, a way to ward off violence. Can you relate this to your feelings about the problems of North Ireland? Did I say that? <laughs> I had it. I had uh, it quoted. I know you have yes, I, about I, I, I do recall that, uh, yes, uh, there is, you know, I think, uh, a violent poetry, uh, a poetry which, um, uh, the sounds of which uh, are metaphors for uh, physical violence, for or, or armed violence, for that matter, um, uh, it, it is it, it's a fact that uh, the struggle in Northern Ireland has led to a great deal of literature, of poetry, and uh, several novels. You know, in the last few years, and uh, there seems to be, you know, uh, the the Civil War and the War of Independence in Ireland in. Uh, the period 1916 to 1921 uh, uh, provoked some of the greatest poetry the world has seen from W.B. Yeats, and there seems to be a connection. You know, W.B. Yeats was a very non-violent man, uh, and and I, you know, it, some of my friends say no, but I think I am too, uh, not very violent or physical, but. I do rage in my poetry, I hope, and uh, I, I certainly rage against the dying of the light, to quote a fellow Celt, Dylan Thomas, uh, and, and uh, the kind of violence, senseless, uh, mad violence that you see in, in Northern Ireland and provoked uh, by the, the power people in Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, is is the dying of the light, I, I believe. Uh, barbarian acts uh, uh, and they're from the dark ages. And, uh, uh, and yet they have ironically or paradoxically produced some very great poetry. Mm -hmm. And you do feel that this outrage has to be expressed? Oh, it? yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And but poetry itself is not at the opposite pole from violence. It is another way of yeah. communicating it in the way that you're suggesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so, yeah, a metaphor for violence, that is to say, it has all the shape and sub, uh, well, all the shape of violence without having the substance. Uh, in a poem, a child may throw a rock at a British soldier, you know. If the child throws a rock at a British soldier, in reality, as the child is probably going to get shot. And, uh, you know, there have been several of that kind of incident in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, so the poetry can be not a, 
it, it, it's wrong to to think I, I, this is my own view uh, that the poem is somehow an exchange for the act and uh, the poem is itself an experience you know not a uh, surrogate experience you know so that if 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 you write a violent poem or if you read a violent poem it should you know uh, get you involved enough so that you get the release that you might get let's say from participating in a street riot you know uh, I think that poetry ought to be that strong yeah and it, does it become poetry that it's impossible to judge you can't say this is good or bad poetry you just say this is real yeah, yeah. Lionel Twilling the, the great American critic has a lot to say about authenticity and sincerity in a recent book I've forgotten the title and uh, this is the area he deals with um, I think you can say that I've seen some very good violent poetry and I've seen some very bad violent poetry uh, yeah, the, the fact that it's violent doesn't make it good or bad it's the way the, you know the, the methods and, and form and so on the, the, the nature of the poetry itself Thank you. Mr. McLeod I'd like to follow up uh, Lou's question uh, with what my perception is of some of the poems that you've done, Jim. Uh, two come to mind, Arresting Officer and The Passion from an earlier book. Uh, those, in those two poems, it seems to me that you, you do tend to be making some statement about brutality as opposed to violence. And I, and I had the feeling in those poems, uh, and I'd like you to comment on this, that those poems are designed more to oppose uh, brutality, not violence, per se, because of course the American Revolution was a violent revolution and was supposedly for good changes and so violence may not be the problem. Uh, it seems to me that just senseless brutality uh, and those two poems seem to me to be, at least in The Passion, seems to be dealing with that kind of thing. It's about the Congo and the gratuitous killing in the Congo. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, the, the poem arresting officers comes in two parts and one is an Irish cop arresting a drunk and the other is an Arkansas cop doing the same thing just about and uh, while well, the language in the arresting officers doesn't bear repeating on a family program I think they call it on the torture um, but uh, the the uh, 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 what I was working with there was uh, the simple recording of two similar scenes uh, with a kind of camera eye point of view I didn't really intend to make any kind of statement one way or the other on violence. I, I would hope that the reader would make up his mind would have his own attitudes having read these poems the other one the passion uh, arose from seeing a French television film of uh, the official soldiery in, in Kivu province in the Congo during the conflict back there um, see, uh, see, they, they just showed right there on television the soldiers beating this guy to death with the uh, with their rifles and uh, it, it, it was absolutely shocking and it uh, you know it hit me it, the, the passion is a very personal kind of poem it hit me at the time uh, at a time when I was having a great deal of religious doubt, you know, uh, just about to bail out of the Catholic Church, if that isn't too irreverent. And uh, uh, I end the poem saying that the beating and the, the senselessness of it uh, was a kind of catalytic thing for me to say, I don't believe in you, God, which is, of course, saying, you know, addressing a God you don't believe in is a, an irony. Uh, uh, I, I really hadn't any definite point of view on violence when I was writing. Though that I was more concerned to, uh, 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 you know, get down uh, in verse certain attitudes, well, well, certain uh, ways of presenting images, really, and allowing the reader to uh, get his attitudes from what he read. You know? uh, Professor, from uh, what you've just said about your own poetry and it's been brought out by our panel, I would like to move into a very specific area concerning values and, and attitudes of people. 
and certainly as a poet I, I would tend to think that you probably have a more in-depth uh, interest and even knowledge of, of mankind than we who are, are not so gifted. And I wish you would take a few moments uh, again to, in, in your own way, compare the values or attitudes of, of, of maybe the people in Washington just to, uh, across the border with those in, in North Idaho and then if you would uh, in some way compare that uh, with the people in other parts of the United States or in, Ar in Ireland where you came from. Uh, where, where are the similarities uh, lie and where are the differences? I've just taken risks with the IRA and now you're getting it closer to home. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that your premise is is altogether uh, can, can altogether be supported. Um, the premise that is that poets are somehow more observant of human nature than others. Uh, I know very many poets, and perhaps I ought to include myself here, who are so selfish that uh, their views of other peoples are always colored by that selfishness, that that uh, arrogance, if you like. Uh, th uh, and so they, they are not really the best uh, judges or interpreters of people. Uh, but for what it's worth, uh, uh, I share with, with Jim, Jim and I have had several conversations over the years about this, I share with him the view that this particular uh, part of the country uh, is, ex in my view, you know, is, is extraordinarily strong uh, uh, strongly uh, Puritan. Now, I've talked with students about this, and they misunderstand the term Puritan. And, and Jim is much more versed in, in, in this matter of Puritanism than I am. He's making a study of it. But uh, my view is that Puritan, yeah, uh, Puritanism, like any philosophy or, or stance, uh, has, has its good as well as its, uh, its bad side. It, it's just a matter of emphasis. Uh, there's a great deal of emphasis on work around here. Uh, maybe that's what makes me so uneasy. Uh, th there's a strong, strong work ethic, I think. Um, I have a kind of pet theory, which m no sociologist would buy for a moment, uh, because I, I don't have very much in the way of solid evidence to support it. But I, I get the impression that many people here have a kind of bitterness of spirit uh, and I kind of figure that they have a bitterness of spirit because this was kind of the last place uh, for their journey across America. Uh, you know, uh, many of the people from here had their roots in Nebraska and Kansas and then moved westward um, uh, to find gold, to find El Dorado, just as I moved westward, you know, to find the streets paved with gold, and found, after all, that they had to till the land and uh, hew timbers to make their homes. And uh, the life was, if anything, harder here than it had been the places they'd left. And uh, very naturally, they became a little bit dour in their uh, you know, this is a generalization, and I'm going to be inundated with people who are gay and happy and, and uh, you know, uh, delightful people who don't have a ounce of dourness in them. But there is, isn't there quite a, an influx, wasn't there quite an influx of Scots here at one time? Yes. Mr. McLeod? <laughs> uh, they... Uh, I don't necessarily make that as a criticism, you know. Um, uh, there's a great strength in the people around here, a great strength of spirit and endurance. But from my own point of view as a writer and a, as a teacher of writing in the, in the area, I feel uh, that they, they do have a, a, a great timidity about expressing themselves in language. They express themselves very well in music and, and painting and sculpture, but uh, in language they, they have perhaps such reverence for it that they don't use it very much, and therefore they, they uh, uh, don't practice it, and, and uh, it takes a great deal of work from them to get to write. On the other hand, I have to say that a good friend of mine from Eastern Oregon, which I include in this area, uh, he has um, 
remark that uh, in his vision, and his is much clearer and purer than mine since he is a native of the soil, uh, he, he sees or foresees within the next decade or so a literary movement in this area which will be as strong uh, as, let's say, the so-called Chicago Renaissance of some time back. And uh, that is, I can, he convinced me that that's right. Uh, there are a lot of writers in this area, a lot of very fine ones. And uh, uh, it could be that uh, in spite of the fact that the spirit of the place uh, that D.H. Lawrence talks about uh, is again it, so to speak, that we could have, you know, it makes it very difficult to write for a North, Northwesterner to write. Uh, in spite of that, we have a, uh, we have quite a blossoming of writing on our hands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mrs. Reed. In the same way, can you share with us what you feel is unique to the, to the Irish character? Mm -hmm. I, I, can you characterize uh, some of these same things that, that go in to make up the sort of spirit, the Irish spirit? <laughs> I can quote G.K. Chesterton and then leave it severely alone. Uh, G.K. Chesterton's quatrain goes, The great gales of Irishmen were the men that God made mad. In their battles they make merry, and all their songs are sad. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to uh, uh, sum up the, the whole thing. Uh, uh, I guess, you know, and it, this is a rather dangerous thing to do because the human personality is such a complex thing that... Uh, you know, to make general statements about the character of the Northwest person, so to speak, is, uh, is wrong-headed. And just in the same way, I always resent people uh, who have rather simplistic views of what the Irish are, you know. Uh, uh, drunken, vainglorious louts, as W.B. Yeats called them, or he called one of them. Uh, uh, there, uh, there are no more drunken, vainglorious lives in Ireland than there are in, statistically in any other country, I imagine. If you could statistically, you know, if Dr. Gallup could send out a poll of drunken, vainglorious lives, uh, how many, what percentage you'd find, I don't know, in any population. But say in the, the generation of, of poets and writers that have been coming out of Ireland recently, are there, are there similarities of spirit? that you can see. Now, certainly it's hard to go from a Samuel Beckett who was from his great despair to anything very, very lively, you can't. But are, uh, are there similarities because of the same roots that you can, can mention yeah. to us? I, I, I'm not sure that I could delve that deep into that. Uh, there are similarities in that um, um, Irish writers are now uh, looking outward a lot more than they had been. Uh, they're much more likely to have been influenced, if that's not a bad word, uh, by European and American writers than they have, than they are likely to have been influenced by the British tradition, let's say, or even the Irish tradition. Um, uh, you get a great range of differences amongst Irish writers today. Uh, I think there's there's a degree of liberation uh, uh, amongst. Irish writers that, that I have seen. As I say, I feel rather detached. I, I, I haven't a survey view of this. I have just occasional pieces, uh, pieces of evidence. Um, I, I, I think the one sort of uh, nationalistic or cultural thing that you find uh, common to Irish writers is eloquence. And that runs absolutely counter to uh, everything else that's going on in modern literature and contemporary literature where the thrust is for spareness and the emphasis on the image, the bald image and the low-key presentation. The, uh, the Irish man is going to babble on just as I am. Why? Why is this? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think it's, it's a reverence for language of a different kind from the Puritan kind that we, we uh, rejoice in using the language, but even if it's not our own, even if it belongs to our invaders and oppressors. Uh, we enjoy using language, and uh, 
uh, you know, we enjoy manipulating the language, you know, and playing on it as, uh, uh, to the greatest possible extent. Um, and this seems to be something that isn't, uh, uh, you know, it, it has a hard time living in the contemporary world where everything is supposed to be fragmented and, uh, you know, spare and uh, all art is supposed to look like post nuclear explosion ruins, you know. Again, I'm making general statements here. Uh, we just enjoy using the language, you know. Yeah, it's wonderful. Mr. McLeod, I, I think that seems to me to be part of the Puritan uh, tradition, too, because the Puritans tended to use poetry, for example, for sure. practical purposes and, yeah. and not for uh, playing around or anything like that. Yeah. I think that seems to be in line with that. I wanted to ask something about censorship. You mentioned this early, Jim, that this is a problem, a literary censor censorship in Ireland. And also you mentioned uh, something that seems to be akin to that, was that you said that the American public seems to only get one version of things in Ireland. I wonder if, if the uh, censorship situation, uh, or if you feel that there's a censorship situation in our own media here in our own country, uh, as well as Ireland. Uh, uh, there's censorship everywhere. Uh, I remember working on a paper briefly in, in uh, northwest Arkansas, my first, uh, the, Arkansas was the first place I came to in the States. And uh, I, I did a certain degree of self-censoring. You know, if I knew, if I had some news item which I knew wouldn't go down well with my news editor, well, I wouldn't hand it in. You know, what's the point? You know, uh, if a friend of his was doing time up in Springdale for DWI or something, you know, I know he's not going to print it, so I'm not going to. You know, that's a hypothetical example, totally fictional, by the way. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I think pressures of space and time have caused the oversimplification of news reporting uh, in American media. I favored the idea I see that's being tossed around that they're going to increase news time on, on commercial television. Um, the censorship I'm talking about is of an entirely different nature in Ireland. Uh, first of all, there was a, a an, an Irish censorship of publications board uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they controlled all the, uh, and then, then, then there was a film censorship board too, and they controlled what we saw and what we read, essentially. At least they attempted to, you know, be, we could always get our things from France and, and Britain, if we get the books we wanted from France and Britain. But uh, it, it, it was just the very fact that this was official, uh, that, that uh, it gave it a, a, a certain tone, you know. And, uh, you know, even books which weren't on the banned list, like Joyce's Ulysses, uh, you couldn't get in a bookstore unless you went up and whispered, I have a copy of Ulysses, please, to the bookstore owner or uh, servant there. And, and then he'd, you know, go in under the desk and look around and slip it to you, you know. Uh, the, one of the greatest novels of the 20th century being treated this way. A and then there was the, the attitude towards literature and writing generally. Um, of course, there are great exceptions to this. Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, literary taxicab drivers, you know, uh, who have taught themselves. Uh, uh, they've read all of Dickens and Anthony Trollope and people like this, and uh, they can quote Yeats at you and so on. And on the other hand, and there's a great reverence for literature and, and anything to do with language. And then on the other hand, you have the Gombeen men who are in control, the, the carpetbaggers uh, who are in control, who want to keep that out of sight, you know. Uh, this is my own uh, hindsight, hind view of Ireland as uh, being of an oppressive place to live. Um, but I found, you know, I didn't escape it coming to America at all. Uh, you and I ran into just a slight incident of that nature last year uh, when uh, a very small matter became a very big one in, in uh, the eyes of some people, and I considered that censorship when uh, 
uh, one person, I believe, we never could track it down, could we? That's always the way with censorship. One person complained about the uh, taste of uh, a poem that uh, one of my, my friends who traveled with me on the Poets in the School thing had read. And uh, that became a, a censorship issue, you know. Uh, and I was kept on us that we didn't do this. And, uh, 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 you know, the remark was made that the poem in question was a little bit raw. And uh, I responded by saying, uh, by quoting Robert Lowell, that all our poems were cooked. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the feeling uh, I've got is that there, there's no way to escape censorship of one kind or another. Uh, uh, America is the least censored of countries. Uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm only too well aware of the uh, shortcomings of American uh, culture and civilization, but I'm also aware and grateful for the, the great benefits. It's the only country which allows me the kind of personal, individual freedom that I do have. Uh, I think I know the world well enough that I wouldn't get away with the kinds of things I get away with in America, and, you know, just in terms of writing. Uh, in any other country that I'm likely to be, be uh, accepted into. Professor McCauley, I would like to uh, change the subject somewhat, although it certainly deals with the rights of particular individuals, and that it, I'm speaking of uh, college professors or faculty members. I believe I am correct that as assistant professor of English at Eastern Washington State College since 1970 that you've been active uh, as spokesman of the faculty at your institution. And I have a two-part question. Uh, first of all, uh, what are the problems that faculty members face at colleges and universities around this country? What are their complaints? What are they unhappy about? Or what do they want changed? And then secondly, how do you recommend that they go about uh, getting those changes? I'm thinking of particularly your position on such things as strikes uh, uh, in the education field. It's a controversial area. Yeah, I, well, uh, I, I, you, you catch me a little off guard here. Um, uh, I'm no way a spokesman, I don't think. I, I do belong to the uh, AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, which is an AFL-CIO affiliate. And I do take the position that, uh, this is just for, for uh, uh, Washington State, uh, uh, for the institutions uh, there. Uh, uh, I do take the position that uh, we have indeed been unfairly treated uh, uh, over the four or five years that I've been here. Um, I take the position that we have indeed, I think, been somewhat demeaned by the attitude of the legislature towards the uh, faculty of the colleges and institutions in their charge. Uh, the, uh, what has happened is that uh, in five years, uh, we, uh, I, I haven't the exact figures, so uh, I'm going to get into serious trouble if I, if I get into too much detail here, but in, in uh, four years anyway, uh, so far as I can recall at this point in time, uh, we've had a, a to a, what has happened is that when I came here uh, to, to Washington State, uh, we were very high up, that Washington was very high up on the ladder, so to speak, on the scale, with regard to uh, quality of education as measured by faculty salaries. And in just the four years that I've been here, we've dropped down almost into the cellar, you know, down in, the, in amongst the 40s, you know, 42nd or somewhere like that. If I'd known you were going to ask this, I would have had sheaves of statistics to to lay on you, but, uh, you know, just on a very personal uh, level, bring it back to me so that I take the heat and not the faculty as a whole. Um, uh, my own feeling was I was very uh, proud and delighted to come out here to teach, and, and uh, I've been treated very well in general, and, and uh, I, I believe I have a good rapport with the people I work with and for. Uh, but I, I do feel that, that we've been badly treated. We, I think we do an, an excellent job. 
but uh, uh, we've been treated in this, badly treated in the sense that uh, our particular concerns uh, have not been uh, kept in mind when decisions about disposal of funds have been made over there in Olympia. Um, the uh, end result of this is not, you know, uh, you know, no, none of the faculty starving, none, nobody's on food coupons or whatever. Uh, but I have seen, I have witnessed the, you know, uh, standard of living of f eminent faculty members, uh, you know, being tightened in. Uh, I think, you know, college teachers, college professors. Uh, uh, you know, they deserve the same kind of esteem, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I can say this because I'm only sort of uh, in by the skin of my teeth. You know, I'm a writer who happens to be a prof. Uh, they deserve the same kind of esteem that is given to doctors and lawyers. We do the same kind of job. We do, in fact, uh, more work to get to be a prof than most of the other professions. And then we, we find ourselves uh, uh, treated uh, really like, like you know, uh, janitors or something, like, like uh, jailers or guardians of the, of the youth, rather than as actually professing a body of knowledge which we, you know, share with uh, the people, who, the students, you know. I, w I wish you'd told me a week ahead that you're going to ask that, because then I could have come to armed. That's one of the bad habits we, of, of, of we okay. here, that we do not give the past questions. <laughs> well, we do feel aggrieved, and anybody who's interested uh, could, could contact uh, any member of the AFT and we'd be, uh, or any of the, the faculty, and we'd be glad to be more informative than I've been here uh, uh, on, the, on the subject. A committee has been, a committee of a thousand has been formed amongst the citizens, the leading citizens of, this, of Washington to try and make uh, the general public aware of uh, the situation and to have some redress of grievances uh, uh, to try and bring us up to where we used to be at least, you know, or close there to. Thank you. Mrs. Reed. Professor McConnell, before the program, we asked if you'd be willing to read a poem or two. And I wonder if you could do that at this time. Have you picked out one or two from your book? Well, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I feel like the uh, uh, little girl who comes to the party with the music tucked under her arm, and she acts surprised then when she's asked to read. And, um, I understand you have a new book coming out, too. You might yeah. mention it. Uh, along the way. Yeah, I do. Th these, the poems I'm going to read uh, are from, uh, they're in this very, this is just a thing we did uh, in December last, a Christmas type thing. Take care of the Christmas presents with this thing. All these poems are included in uh, After the Blizzard, which is coming out from University of Missouri Press next month. Um, also, next month, my family and I are uh, going to work, uh, well, I'm going to work, they're coming with me, to the University of Victoria, B.C., where I'm doing a stint as visiting poet. Uh, so it seems appropriate to read uh, it, this poem called Three for the Road. Uh, it's about moving, and uh, we're about to move. And uh, this time we'll do it differently. But uh, there was a time when uh, moving, and we did a lot of it. Uh, I, feel, uh, I feel we did a lot of it. Uh, moved from Ireland to Arkansas, Arkansas to Pennsylvania, and then Pennsylvania here. And then, you know, different addresses along the way there. Uh, I finally got it right down as to what my function was uh, when we moved, and that was get drunk and leave it to the women. <laughs> and uh, the, these poems uh, are about, about that. They're called Three for the Road. One, packing. Bulging with books, the beer case rides the swell in the dismantled room. Light swivels from a solitary bottle far off across the floor. Lying flat, and motionless as possible, 
I search out Venus high on the ceiling, an exotic dancer spinning round and round the bare bulb. Freight another carton, set it adrift, time for a final beer, then bed, where you will watch me twitch all night, battered antennae still picking up signals from wheeling ships and stars. Two, in thy horizons. Uh, in, in Ireland, it's called horizons, uh, which makes a nice pun on horizons. Uh, so I'm going to say, two, in thy horizons, which is, of course, a quotation from Hamlet, nymph, in thy horizons may all my sins be numbered. Diaphanous on tiptoe, she dances from the mirror through piled bric-a-brac, waiting for the moving van. The stripped walls encompass the glade she dances in, one arm undulating to a phantom reed pipe, one hand on her womb where the infant dances too. Earlier in the kitchen, hunkered, packing dishes, swearing like a fishwife, one cheek smudged, she reached for some trivial utensil with the same sylvan grace. Three, moving. Blessed are the itinerants, strung like a phone call between the last house and the next, they move through pop songs, commercials, squinting in rear view mirrors, lipping cool cans of beer. Behind them, the drapes left hanging like blank movie screens in the windows. Ahead, the old beer cans, broken clocks, shredded sneakers, cracked chairs. The dogs of new neighbors will malign them. The faded drapes will flicker like old movies in the unfamiliar drafts. Professor McCauley, uh, unfortunately we have run out of time and there's so much more we'd like to talk to you about and I'd love to hear some more of your readings and I know our viewing audience has enjoyed immensely uh, that one particular reading and certainly we'd like to have you back at, at some future date and continue what I feel has been a most stimulating conversation with you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Just wait till spring until I come back out of Victoria, B.C. We'll be looking forward to that and you have a nice trip. Thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, Mary Lou Reed and James McLeod for what I consider very outstanding questions that were most informative, I'm sure, as our guests responded to those. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been our pleasure today to have as our guest Professor James J. McCauley an assistant professor of English at Eastern Washington State College. May I take this opportunity to once again remind you that from time to time we receive letters or telephone calls or some form of message from you in the viewing audience suggesting certain guests or subject matters. I would like once again to invite you to continue to do this and if you wish to contact uh, this particular program uh, you might send that to me, Tony Stewart, at North Idaho College 1000 West Garden Avenue, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. If it's for the program, I will look at and consider it. If it's for the panel, I will uh, give them the message. I want to thank you for being with us, and let me invite you to be with us again next week when we'll be interviewing another personality of the Northwest, our United States. Thank you for being with us. College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. The preceding student production was brought to you by videotape recording.